Welcome everyone. It is now 7.30, so I am going to get started with our talk tonight. Thank you all for joining. I'm very excited about tonight's talk and something we've been planning for quite some time. I would like to welcome everybody who might be new to the California Native Plant Society or the Santa Clara Valley chapter. And um, tonight's presentation, California's Oaks and their Countless Relations. Before we begin the talk, I wanted to acknowledge that the work done by the Santa Clara Valley chapter of the California Native Plant Society lies in the homeland of the Mawekma Ohlone, the Amatsun, Amamutsun Tribal Band, the Tamiya Nation, and the Rami Tush Ohlone. This land was theirs for thousands of years and was taken forcibly from them. Despite two centuries of oppression and genocide, they still live and thrive in this area today. We acknowledge and respect them for their land stewardship, culture, language, and humanity. The Santa Clara Valley chapter of CNPS hopes to learn from them and support their work to restore traditional practices and heal from historical trauma. If this is your first talk, we would love to know how you found out about us and where you are. So if you would like to share in the chat your town, you can share your name if you'd like. If you're here with a school and you'd like to share your school, please feel free to do that. It would be really neat to know who we have with us. Tonight's team is myself as host. I'm Stephanie Morris, and we are hoping we will have Penny Pollock join us as the question and answer moderator. If she is not able to make it, I will go ahead and do the question and answers. And we have Gladys Mercier as our YouTube moderator. Welcome to those of you who are on YouTube. Anyone who's watching via YouTube can go ahead and post questions on the YouTube channel and Gladys will copy those over into the Zoom meeting so that we can have our speaker, Kate, answer those questions. And on tech tonight, we have Vivian New. And our speaker, of course, is Kate Marion Child, who I will introduce in a moment. I'd like to say a few quick things about our chapter. The California Native Plant Society is a nonprofit environmental organization. We were founded in 1965, and we have over 10,000 members. We have 35 chapters that are spread all over California and Baja California. The Santa Clara Valley chapter covers Santa Clara and Southern San Mateo counties. And our mission is to save California's native plants and habitats by bringing together science, education, conservation, and gardening to power the native plant movement. We welcome your support of this movement to conserve California's native plant diversity. We have two journals, the Artemisia and the Flora that you will get if you decide to become a member and you are not already. We also have a chapter newsletter called The Blazing Star and discounts to local nurseries. You can join at cnps.org slash join. And we, I will put that in the chat in a minute. We have a few upcoming events. The first is called Project 467. It's on Wednesday, December 8th at 7.30 p.m. And it's enhancing native plant diversity at Edgewood, which is up in Redwood City with Stuart B. Weiss presenting. We have a photo group meeting on Friday, December 10th at seven o'clock. And we have a beginner's bird and plant ID walk at Lake Cunningham Park on Saturday, December 18th at 9 a.m. You can find out more about these events on our website, cnps-scv.org and meetup.com. And we also have some um, QR codes you can scan if you'd like to get the more direct approach. Our online nursery will be closed next week during Thanksgiving week, but it is open now. The nursery does offer delivery between Belmont and San Jose or pick up at the nursery with plants that are ordered online. All the proceeds benefit our chapter. We also have t-shirts, books, and more available and plants are continually being added to the website. So check that out if you'd like to get some plants in during the fall and winter rainy seasons, the perfect time to plant natives right now. And you can also get timely updates and the news and announcements through our mailing list, which goes out once a week as an announcement only mailing list. There's a kind of a long um, subscription email here. You can also find that information on our website and I will post it in the chat in a little bit. 
We have a special scholarship happening right now. It's a horticultural scholarship program and it's for supporting a local student pursuing a horticultural career with a focus on California native plants. The scholarship amount is $750 and applications are due by January 31st, 2022. And check out the link for more information on that scholarship if you'd like to apply. During the talk, please keep your microphone muted. And if you have questions for our speaker, you would like, we would like you to type those into the chat box. Um, if you don't know how to do that, you can either use your mouse to hover above or below on the screen and you'll see a little box called chat. Click that and type it in. We expect to finish by 9 p.m. We will probably finish before that because Kate's going to do a portion of the talk and then have questions and answers. And then anybody who would like to stay a little bit later, she'll share some more information. And the program will be recorded on YouTube so that you can view it later. So I'm going to introduce our speaker now, Kate Marion Child. I have her book here with me. Um, she's, oops, I don't know if it'll show up here. Eh, it's having a little difficulty showing. There we go. It's the magic, try to find the book. Um, I'll post a link so you can see a copy of the cover of her book. Kate is the author of the book called Secrets of the Oak Woodlands, Plants and Animals Among California's Oaks. With humor, affection, and scientific accuracy, Kate profiles the behaviors, social structures, and interrelationships of 22 species found in California's oak woodlands. Kate lives in a yurt near U Ukiah, surrounded by six different types of oak and also abundant wildlife. You can go to her website, katemarionchild.com, which I will post in the chat, to purchase a signed copy of her book, Close Focus Binoculars, and also Oak Identification Guides, and you can also learn on her website about restoring insect populations. So I'm going to turn it over to Kate now and welcome everybody. Thank you so much, Kate, for joining us tonight. Well, thank you for having me. I am really delighted to be giving a talk to your chapter of CNPS again. And I'm now going to share my screen. Okay, now, got it. Okay, does that look good to everybody? Looks good to me, yeah. And you can hear me, okay. I so, sounds like somebody's not muted. Okay, so I'm just going to get started. Uh, my talk tonight is going to be a celebration of some of the countless wonders that exist in California's oak woodlands. But what are oak woodlands? Well, they're hardwood forests that are dominated by oaks and other trees and shrubs that live in association with them, like buckeyes and madrones and California bay laurels and shrubs like manzanita and toyon and mountain mahogany and quite a few others. And if you don't know how to recognize an oak, oaks are the only trees in North America, except for their cousins, the tan oaks, that produce acorns. Oops, not advancing. So you can look for acorns either on the trees or on the tree or on the ground. And acorns are the only nuts in North America that are nestled in these little cups or cupules or caps. And sometimes the cups are all that you'll find. And they are actually the best way to identify an oak species. So can you see how different these uh, three different kinds of acorns are from each other? There are three different species represented here. And if you know what species these are, why don't you put that in the chat, put the species that you see here if you know. And by the way, the green ones will turn brown as they mature. And guess what? Acorns aren't just any old nuts. These are nuts of native trees, oaks, that support more life forms than any other plant in North America. 
and the oak woodlands that the oaks live in support more diversity and more total number of species than any other ecosystem type in the Western United States. I'm hoping that by the end of this talk, you will be as eager as I am to go out wandering, watching, waiting, and wondering, the four Ws. And that's what naturalists do. I'm a naturalist and we're interested in everything, birds and mammals, reptiles and amphibians, plants, fungi, lichens, and how they all interrelate with each other and work together as a whole. And tonight I'm gonna to talk about a few of the a few species that we see so often that we take them for granted and never even wonder if there's anything special or extraordinary about them. And I'll talk about some other things that are very easy to miss unless you look really closely and or spend time quietly waiting and watching. So what is the plant in this picture? Well, it's poison oak. Most of you probably know that, but who, have you ever looked closely at poison oak from you know, a safe enough distance? You can really get very close to it and not worry. You, don't, it's, you only get contact dermatitis if you touch it. So have you ever noticed these little seeds of poison oak? And after the husks come off, they look like this. So right now, you should be able to go out and see these seeds or droops on female poison oak bushes. They'll stick around for months. And you may not have known that poison oak bushes come in male and female, but the ones with the berries are the female ones. And you may not know that after acorns, poison oak berries are probably the most important wildlife food in California mice and wood rats and squirrels and deer and bear, bears and at least 53 species of birds eat them, way more than eat any other plant that I have figured out. And one of the birds that eats these berries is the northern flicker. And this flicker is surrounded by poison oak berries. And in fact, these seeds, as, which as I said, are actually called droops, are way more and what it always I say, in fact, these seeds are way more important with birds than acorns are. So if you see a bird in a poison oak bush, there's a good chance that you will see them picking off the droops one by one. In this gorgeous watercolor by Anne Magunte, who illustrated my book, this is a wren tit eating poison oak droops. And they rely on them for seven months of the year when there aren't very many insects around, rentits do. So back to the four W's. One day last April, I was walking along and I saw this hole in a dead snag, which was about 70 feet away. This hole here. And there are poison oak vines climbing up it. And this was April, and that's the height of nesting season, bird nesting season. So the hole was, it was a little worn, a little light colored around the edges. And it looked to me like it just might be the entrance to an active nest cavity. I had, of course, no idea what kind of bird it might be. But certain bird species nest only in cavities. So I came back the next day and I sat down and, and I just waited, just quietly sitting on the ground. And sure enough, within 20 minutes, I saw this. Do you see this blue right here? So I'm going to play you a little video. So that's a male Western bluebird and that's the female who just flew in. So they eventually uh, left and so did I for a while as I continued my walk. <clears throat> but on the way back, I just casually glanced over at that hole again to see if anything was happening. And guess what I saw? Now, I, I don't think anybody can guess, but you can try if you want in the chat. 
I'll give you a, a couple of sentence, seconds. So I saw this. And if you know who this is, put that in the chat. This is the same nest hole. It's, uh, the light was a little different when I got there. But now a female northern flicker is gazing out of it. So I watched the flicker for a while, and then I left for a while, and then I came back, and this is who I saw sitting in the nest hole. And this is the mate of that female. This is a male northern flicker, and you can tell that by this red mustache that he has. So those bluebirds had probably been checking out the status of the nest cavity and were undoubtedly disappointed to see eggs in the bottom of it because they wanted it for their second brood. They were already nesting somewhere else, I figured out later. And I can relate to those bluebirds because housing is pretty short around here where I live and I'm actually looking for housing right now. And for cavity nesting birds, the problem is that people cut down dead and dying trees and limbs and dead or decaying wood is the best place for cavity nesting birds to either find or excavate nest cavities. But these flickers at least found a really good cavity. And here's what life is like for this flicker parent, as well as for me sitting on the ground watching him. This is what, uh, what it sounds like all around and what it feels like. And there were two birds in the background that we heard. One was an orange crowned warbler and the other one, whoops, not meaning to do that again. Let's see. Okay, and the other one was a Pacific Slope flycatcher. So I went back to that same nest over and over again. Nests are wonderful places uh, to be to be when you're a naturalist because the birds are captive actors. You know that they will keep coming back over and over again, just as I did. And here is the flicker dad feeding his chicks by regurgitating food. And guess what he was regurgitating? Ant larvae. Flicker adults eat mainly ants and some beetles and their babies get fed ant larvae and love them. And apparently those parents found enough ant larvae for at least one of their brood to survive because here is this teenager and this orange stripe tells us that this is a male teenager. And now watch and listen closely. You will hear a call known as the wordle call that is rarely heard and no one knows how it's made. And you'll notice that the, the chick perks up before we can hear it. Just before we hear the wordle, the chick uh, suddenly comes to life. So that means that his hearing is better than ours. And I only found out today when I was doing some research how rare this call is. And I think I should probably submit this video to the Cornell Lab of Ornithology's media library because it seems like they only have one other recording of it. So all that you've just seen and heard came from me seeing a hole in a tree. And I want to encourage you all to go out and uh, look for things that just look a little different. And I want to emphasize the importance of listening. I often hear birds before I see them, just as I often hear Western gray squirrels gnawing on, on nuts 
before I see them. And here we're going to see a Western gray squirrel gnawing on something. And uh, if you know what bird was calling in the background, put that in the chat. Maybe I'll play it again just to, whoops, give you another chance to figure that out. So, Check out this squirrel's tail. It's serving a couple of functions right now. And if you stay after the q and I'll tell you about the 11 uses of a gray squirrel's tail. And if my nine-year-old friend Ursula is able to be here tonight, she might put another couple of functions in the chat that we thought of together the other day. So when you go out wandering, watching, waiting, and wondering, it's best to go without earbuds if you really want to have an exciting time. And also leave a lot of time so you can really get absorbed in whatever you see or hear. For me, it's about the best thing I can do for my mental health. It's like a meditation, but for me, it's even more interesting than meditating, regular meditating. So how many of you have ever seen this bird that's on the cover of my book? It's an acorn woodpecker, and you can see on the trunk of the tree that there are acorns that this bird and his clanmates have pounded into the tree to store for the winter. And this happens to be a male bird. And uh, you can go to my website, as Stephanie said, to order or sign copies of this book. And I just want to say, most people have no idea, but for authors, it's not really great if you buy their books on Amazon. I, I spent five years on this book and I make about 70 cents a book if you buy it on Amazon. But if you go to my website, I make a grand $9 a book. So here is another acorn woodpecker. And if you've ever seen one of these birds, and if you're not in a situation where you might wake somebody up, say with me their call. Waka, waka, waka. Again, waka, waka, waka. These are probably the most vocal, visible, and eccentric birds, birds of all the species that live in California's oak woodlands. They constantly fly around and talk to each other and peck holes in trees and pound acorns into those holes to store them for the winter. And all that activity nourishes me. They're also very relational. They like being near each other. And it just occurred to me recently that maybe the reason I've always felt comforted in their presence is because it felt like being in the midst of a family. And it turns out they are a family. This isn't just a random collection of birds. These birds on these pieces, on these branches and snags are all part of the same clan. And a clan can have up to 16 members. And uh, you can see here that there are up to three breeding females, up to seven breeding males, and then these non-breeding helpers. And these are what I call a world-class species because their polygynandrous breeding system is unique in the world, meaning that all the females can mate with all the males and vice versa as is their sharing of all the acorns that they stash in trees, their sharing of nests, and the fact that these birds in the lower row here, the non-breeding helpers, who are the offspring of the breeding birds, stay with their parents for up to five years, helping out with the chores, with the childcare and the storing of acorns and drilling of holes. And that's unheard of in any other bird species. And uh, while we're at it, look at these, at the females on the left and on the males of the right and see if you can tell the difference between the females and the males and put that in the chat. 
So acorn woodpeckers have the most complex social structure of any vertebrate species in the world. And I, I can't go into all their wild and wacky customs right now, but I have a rollicking chapter on them in my book. And to end this section on acorn woodpeckers, here is another tree with a hole of interest in it. And as I came back over and over again to look at this hole, I finally saw this very curious young acorn woodpecker who has been raised in this hole by three mothers, seven fathers, and six siblings. And this youngster is shortly going to take their first leap into the big unknown world. But in many ways, they're luckier than most baby birds because they have a whole clan to protect them, feed them, and show them the ropes. I don't know the gender of this bird because uh, baby birds look, they all look like males. So this could be either a male or a female. So what are some other fascinating things that are going on in the oak woodlands right now? Well, looking at the ground is a good place to start. Right now, leaves are falling and oak leaves make the best leaf litter known to soil organisms. So please don't rake up your leaves and put them in your green bin to be taken away. Put them somewhere on the ground. In one square meter of oak leaf litter, there can be a million nematodes, which we're not able to see. But there are also organisms that you can actually see that are big enough, like this caterpillar that just appeared right here. This is a caterpillar that eats nothing but dead oak leaves. And apparently there are dozens of caterpillars that eat nothing but dead oak leaves. And check out this in the upper left, this wolf spider. And if you go out at night with a flashlight into a, you know, an open natural area and you point it ahead of you 10 or 15 feet, you might see some gleaming eyes, very tiny little gleaming eyes. And if you follow your flashlight beam to the end, you will find, a, you might find a wolf spider there. I have been faked out by little droplets of water. And here in the upper right is a newt. And if you have ever seen a newt, put newt in the chat. There's gonna be a lot in the chat, sorry, <laughs> chat monitors. And since the rains have started, newts have left their hiding places in leaf litter. They spend the dry leaf season in places like leaf litter and, and mossy hollows. And they've begun their epic migrations and very slow migrations up to two miles to their birth waters where they first hatched out of an egg. This is a pond at a lovely oak woodland sanctuary called the Oak Granary. And last February, I was walking by the shallow end of this little pond down at this end. And if I hadn't looked closely, I just would have seen some beautiful reflections on some grass stems and some dead leaves uh, that had recently fallen from trees. But I did look closely because that's what I always do when I'm at a creek pool or a pond in, in, during the rainy season. And I saw these orange brown things, orangey brown things here and realized those weren't dead leaves. There are some dead leaves in this pond, but these are dozens and dozens and dozens, maybe a hundred or so newts. And here's a closer look at a few of them. This is a photo that I took. And by being still and watching for a long time, I noticed some behaviors that at least one newt scientist was surprised to learn about. And it's this situation here where there are two newts here. You can see two sets of eyes. This is the um, male newt, and you can tell by this really long tail. And he has his front arms around the female newt, who is here extruding some eggs. And here are some 
egg masses, those little sort of tan dots are all eggs in a, in a bunch of gelatin. And I don't know if any, how many of you know that in California, we have four newt species and they are the most toxic salamanders in the world. So these are also world-class animals in my book. And in, in my uh, real actual book that I wrote, <laughs> I tell a story about three Oregon hunters who were found dead in a campsite. And that's all I'm gonna tell you right now about that. And have you heard about newts being involved in something called a co-evolutionary arms race with common garter snakes? This garter snake might be able to get away with eating this newt that would kill dozens of humans or a hundred or more if the newt were ground up and fed to humans in small quantities. Um, but this garter snake has evolved resistance to the toxins in newts. But don't feel too sorry for this newt because the garter snake might not evolve, have evolved enough resistance. And it might decide after about 80 minutes that if it wants to survive, it's gonna have to let this newt go. And chances are the newt will walk away unscathed. So this winter, take time to look closely in ponds or creeks for individual newts or pairs of newts or newts mating or newts newt mating balls or newt egg laying parties or individual egg masses, which are often attached to vegetation and are often found around the edges of ponds. You, you might also find a Pacific chorus frog with his gular pouch pooched out. So now we're gonna to move to something that I observed last weekend. Well, last Saturday, I climbed a hill behind my yurt and I was walking on a deer trail and I was surprised to learn recently that some people have never even heard of deer trails or seen one. So right here, this is a deer trail and here is another uh, more well-used one. So I went over hill and down dale and into a live oak grove and I saw this on my left. And walking a few steps more, I saw this scene and walking and just ahead of me, I saw this. And there's something that all three of these photos have in common. The bush in front of us right now <clears throat> is called chamise. And most people would just walk right by it on the deer trail, it's right here and not look at it twice. But being a naturalist is all about looking twice or thrice. And I looked thrice because I wondered why the center of it was so dark. And what was it about that first pile of stuff? Does anything look unusual here? Let's take a closer look. See this pile of sticks here? Would that have ended, those sticks have ended up concentrated there naturally? And what about these leaves over here? And then what about this scene? What's this pile right here? Did some human rake this bunch of leaves and twigs together? So let's get a little closer view and let's look from a different angle. It looks like a pile of leaves and twigs, right? Well, if you follow my pointer, you will see that a wood rat just appeared. It's right down here under the branch. And this wood rat and her great grandmother and grandmother and mother built this magnificent mansion branch by branch, sprig by sprig over the course of many years. And now she's doing that. And here you can see her bigger and closer up. And by the way, she's not actually a rat. If you look at DNA, she's much closer to a giant mouse. And she's carrying the leaves of a highly toxic but wonderful native plant called coffee berry into her house to store in her leaching room. Leaching room? Yep. Inside this house, there are corridors with openings for light and air on every level. She's chewed out these corridors or she or her 
her ancestors. There are several bedrooms. There's a dedicated bathroom and there are dedicated pantries, one for berries, one for acorns, one for mushrooms, one for leaves. She's a vegan, you see. And these coffee berries will first go into her leaching room to outgas because they're too toxic for her to eat right away, even though she has an amazing array of bacteria in her gut or gut, gut organisms, I'm not sure if they're bacteria, that help her digest highly toxic plants. Now, if I hadn't seen her, which I wouldn't have, because she is nocturnal and she rests in her house during the day. So how could I have known for sure that this was the home of a wood rat? Well, I knew because I just know what wood rat houses look like by now. But one thing you could do is look for fresh, the fresh vegetation that they pile on their houses to uh, keep building them. And if it's green vegetation, that means the house is occupied or at least it's being maintained. So it's really hard to see because it's far away, but there's some green vegetation right here. And, but how can we know that it didn't just fall off the tree or um, it's not even part of the tree uh, growing on the tree? So here's how we can tell. So here it is, getting closer. And now we can tell that it's not attached to the tree, but the signature of wood rats is this diagonal cut. That means that a wood rat cut this sprig and brought it to the house to pile it on to make the house bigger. So soon after I sat and looked at this wood rat house, I walked back along that uh, deer trail and I saw something on the ground. And it was a sprig of live oak leaves. And see this diagonal cut? That means that the owner of this house was high up in the canopy the night before, and she cut this sprig intending to collect it later, but for some reason she didn't. Maybe an owl came along and scared her and she went into her house before she had a chance to collect it. But she was, probably collecting this to eat it. Because you can see here some nibble marks. And those are um, wood rat nibble marks. So she tasted it before she cut it from the tree. And live oak leaves, believe it or not, are one of the favorite, probably are the favorite food of wood rats along with acorns. So back to this chemise book, bush, you probably guessed it, this dark pointy mass inside this chemise bush is a wood rat house. And this messy collection of sticks and leaves is a wood rat house built around a stump. And here we have a wood rat bringing live oak leaves into her house to stash in her bedroom for her midday snack. You can see she already has a stash and she's, you can also see in the lower right-hand corner that she's been eating acorns in bed right here, kind of like eating popcorn in bed. So I do have a chapter on wood rats and where you'll also learn that they are world-class animals because they build the most complex above ground houses of any mammal in the world except humans. They're also vital to the health and vitality of ecosystems because their large many chambered houses provide shelter for a whole host of other organisms like spiders and millipedes and newts and giant pacific salamanders and brush rabbits and even snakes even rattlesnakes in, in the desert and all these squatters who live on the periphery of the house are called inquilines which means uninvited guests I hope you won't have any inquilines for Thanksgiving this year. The presence of all these inquilines increases the abundance and diversity of whatever ecosystem 
uh, wood rats are in. So let's see. Okay, that's the end of what I what I have to say about wood rats for now. And just the other day, I saw a bird called an oak titmouse outside my window, and it was whacking a drab inchworm type caterpillar against a branch. Now, a month ago, I would have thought, what? A caterpillar in mid-November? We only have caterpillars in the spring and summer. But in the last month, I've read an amazing book uh, just published this year, written by Doug Tallamy, who is an entomologist and wildlife ecologist par excellence in Delaware. And I already knew from him that most terrestrial baby birds need to eat caterpillars for, their, for the proteins and fats and carotenoids that are in the caterpillars and that if they don't get them, they probably won't survive to adulthood. And that's why this Robin is carrying all these cats to his babies. And that's why this acorn woodpecker is feeling, feeding caterpillars to his babies. But as far as that oak titmouse and those, uh, that caterpillar that I saw the titmouse whacking, everybody knows that there aren't any caterpillars around in winter, right? Wrong. They are around, but we never see them because they are masquerading as twigs. This is a caterpillar. And 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 here are some caterpillars suspended from their own silk looking like twigs. And here are even caterpillars masquerading as lichen, as lichens. This is a caterpillar and this is a caterpillar. And here's one masquerading as bark. So my challenge to you, and I know many of you are young people with excellent eyesight, is to go out looking for these camouflaged caterpillars this winter. Now, Doug Tallamy is in Delaware, and at first I was thinking, well, he's, those, that must be just on the East Coast. I don't think we have those here. I've never seen them. Then I did see a caterpillar that looked like a twig just the other day in the mouth of a titmouse. And what I'm going to do is use my close focusing binoculars to look. So I've never seen one of these twig, one of these caterpillars disguised as a twig or bark. I think they're pretty hard to find. And so I'm going to use these. They're the best tool I know for looking for them. And they're also incredible for looking at all kinds of insects, other insects and glorious magnification, as well as flowers and spider webs and lizards and tarantula burrows and the contents of the silk balls that the tarantulas push out of their burrows after their babies have molted several times. And on my website, so on my website, you can find those, you can find and read about those binoculars and you can also uh, read about and order my oak identification guides. These are two-sided and laminated and they include these colorful things along the bottom that are called galls that are some way, times the only way to identify an oak species. So uh, my half an hour is uh, probably more than up. And if you have to leave now, um, please, Go forth and multiply the number of native species you recognize and make discoveries of things that are new to science. And this winter, look for newts and caterpillars pretending to be sticks. And in the spring, look for bird nests. And in the summer, look for tarantula burrows. And any time of year, look for wood rat houses. So now uh, I'm going to stop screen sharing for the Q&A. And after that, anyone who wants to stick around can be regaled with a few, a little bit more oak woodland lore. Great, thank you so much, Kate. Mm -hmm. 
So I think one thing that, that really carries through is just how many species really depend on oaks, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that you would never know. Do you see people you recognize? Yes. Nice. Ed. Hi, Barbara. Hi, Madge. Excellent. Well, we have a couple of questions here and some, some good comments. So I'll read a few of them off from the chat. So a lot of people guessed quail for the uh, first sound you were asking about in the background. Great. And the first question we have is somebody was wondering what could be a suitable substitute for decaying trees to have in the backyard? Well, you can put up bird boxes. That's why people do. Bird boxes have made quite a difference in species whose numbers have been declining due to lack of habitat, of nest cavity habitat. And each bird box um, for each, each species needs particular specifications of the size of the entrance hole and the distance from the entrance hole to the floor of the house. So um, you can find those specifications online. Titmice and bluebirds and nuthatches and house wrens all kind of take the same size of bird box. And you have to be careful to clean them out after every season to make sure that no um, mites and, or anything that could be, you know, cause disease could be left in the boxes. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. And if, when you asked about the woodpecker difference between the male and the female, um, here are a couple of responses. The white touches the red in the males, but not the females. And one other poster said the males seem to have slightly longer beaks. Hmm. I haven't noticed that. <laughs> Maybe that's something new. It could be, yeah. So another one from YouTube, I'm gonna try to batch it so that goes in the same area, but I'm not seeing it right now. Let me scroll down real quick. I'm not finding it right now. My mnemonic aid for uh, the difference is that the females have a black headband. Okay. And let's see the next question. Oh, a few comments. So one person commented, they had been enjoying a family of acorn woodpeckers in their state park backyard for the past three years. Their nest in a tall foothill pine is a bent over decaying branch. The offspring do help out. Mm -hmm. And here's an interesting tidbit. Walter and Grace Lance were on their honeymoon in June Lakes, California, near Mammoth Lakes, and their noisy relationship with the acorn woodpecker at the suggestion of Grace that Walter make a cartoon character of it. This was the inspiration for Woody Woodpecker. <laughs> so the, I guess their honeymoon was in 1940 and they were <laughs> captivated. That's pretty cool. I'm not uh, sure that's true. I <laughs> actually was told once that um, for sure that acorn woodpeckers weren't the model. It was either a pileated woodpecker or, or an ivory-billed woodpecker. I think a pileated woodpecker because the sh the, they're just different shapes. Woody woodpecker is a, a different shape. Okay. And the call isn't the same. Demanding a further research. And yeah. one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine people commented on newts. And um, there was a really interesting post uh, about a group that tracks, youth, tracks newts. Um, if you're interested in newts, consider joining the Newt Patrol. And they put the website in the chat. It's bioblitz.club slash newts. And they're South Bay Area and they go and look at newts and they um, probably categorize and catalog. So that's pretty neat. One person asked, oh, go ahead. No, I wasn't gonna say anything. Okay. That's One person asked, where was the oak preserve with the newts? Can the general public go there? No, unfortunately not. It's on private land in Potter ah. I know. <laughs> yeah, that was really neat. Um, and a few people guessed on the wood rat nest uh -huh. and also commented that they can house multiple generations, which can be up to 10 feet high, according to this person, which is 
I mean, even just looking at the pictures you showed, they're pretty big houses. They can be very big. They can be up to eight or maybe 10, but yeah. they don't house, they're built by multiple generations, but they usually only, they usually house only one wood rat. And the reason I was calling them she is because the female wood rats are the ones that are uh, most likely to live in the bigger, more together houses uh, because they are stable while, while males are always roaming around and sleeping in sort of crash pads in order to find as many females as they can and make it. <laughs> um, I think you might've answered this, but I'm not sure. So I'm going to ask it the, about the wood rats. Do they cut the branches or just take the fallen ones? And you were talking about one of them being up in the trees. Cutting them. Well, so they cut sprigs and and um, the the small green soft flexible vegetation stems. They can cut those with their teeth, but they find big, sometimes amazingly big branches and drag them to their nests. They they don't cut big. They they don't gnaw like beavers. They just. Uh, they, they drag the hard woody material to their nests. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, a few other questions. I'm not 100% sure I understand this, so I, I may have Elaine clarify, but maybe you'll, you'll, maybe it'll make sense to you, Kate. It says, can you tell me more about the name descent used to name the woodpeckers? About the what? The name descent, as in descending. So Kate, yeah. Can you hear me? I was up at Filoli. You know where that is in Woodside? Yeah. And I go up there quite often and, and do a lot of bird watching. And I, I always see a lot of acorn woodpeckers. And one day when I was up there, I saw a large group of maybe at least 40 woodpeckers, very, very close together. And kind of, um, they were making a lot of noise, which attracted me. So I looked over and I saw them. They weren't very far from me. <clears throat> and they were just kind of going down, 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 you know, like flying. And I wondered if, because then I, I came home and I looked up what a group of woodpeckers was called. And it said descent, as in a gander of geese or a flock of, you know. Oh. And, and so I wondered if it's when they were teaching their young to fly and how they are, <clears throat> they're so family orientated. <clears throat> they gather together and I wondered, I didn't know if you knew any more about their behavior, the way, because that's the first time I had seen them grouped together in such large numbers and just kind of going from branch to branch, lower, lower, lower. And then all of a sudden they all took off. So well, it was uh, really special. Who, who, who am I uh, uh, talking to? Elaine McMaster. Oh, hi. So um, no, it wasn't anything about teaching babies to fly. It's something that I left out of my talk. I had it in there in the first place, but I left it out because I didn't have room. Okay. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to talk about it. So there are those non-breeding helpers who are the offspring of their parents. And they are, the reason they stick around for up to five years with the clan is because they need to stick with the, with the acorn granary. That's the storehouse of acorns that the clan puts together, uh, keeps building over many years. They can have up to 50,000 holes for acorns in what's called a granary. So, and those, those non-breeding helpers uh, have a drive to reproduce, but they can't, repro they can't mate with their parents but they're stuck with their parents until they can find another clan where the last bird of one gender or the, or the other, the last breeding bird of one gender, gender or the other has died. So let's say there are three female breeders in one clan and one of them dies. Then there are two. Then let's say another one dies and there's only one. It's only when the last one dies that there's what's called a breeding vacancy. And so let's say uh, our clan, the one I showed you, clan A with 16 birds. Let, uh, so the, let's say a female bird from that clan flies off every day. She flies off on missions to try to find a breeding vacancy in another clan. And when she finally does, when she arrives at that clan headquarters and she goes, waka, 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 and no female comes out, 
she knows that that female has died or disappeared and she decides, oh, there's a breeding vacancy here. I'm gonna get it. And so she uh, sticks around and introduces herself to the, her new husbands. And then uh, another bird from a different clan, let's say clan C will show up and she'll go waka waka waka. And this new bird from clan A will come out and greet her. And she'll think, oh my God, there must have been a breeding vacancy here and she's trying to take it, but I want it. So those two birds, those two female birds will fight each other. They, they chase each other around. They make a lot of noise. They collide with each other. They peck at each other's heads and they eat. And, and, and then the noise either draws their sisters to come and fight with them in sibling coalitions, or they might even go home to recruit their sisters. So then there might be uh, two clans worth of sisters, or there could be three or four clans worth of sisters all fighting each other. And what add, this is brand new information in the last year or so it's come out that it's not just the non-breeding helpers who are fighting and who are present in this situation, but adult breeding birds will fly in from sometimes miles away just to watch the spectacle. And no one's quite sure why they do that, what they get out of it. But, but I've never heard of 50, that's amazing. Thanks, Elaine. Yeah, thank you, it was, fat. It, was, it was amazing. And there are a lot of acorn woodpeckers up there that I've seen for years and years, but never had seen that except for just one day. Because the, trail, the trails aren't used very much by people anymore. So they really have a lot more privacy. Oh. So I'm getting to see a lot more activity than I would otherwise. Where is that? At Filoli. Uh, at Filoli. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've seen, uh, so whenever you hear a lot of cacophony among acorn woodpeckers, there's probably a fight going on for a breeding vacancy. And I have seen two birds fly into each other and then both fall to the ground stunned. Wow. And then, yeah, and then get up and fly away after a while. That's awesome. Thank you, Kate. That was awesome. Yeah. Uh, I and I had we... met you at the Folger Estate when you gave a talk. Oh, yeah. Uh, I bought your binoculars and I have sold them to several other people through you. Oh, great. I Thank love you. them. And I have them with me all the time. They're fabulous. And read Thank your book. You. I love it. Yeah. Thank you. I hope we get to get one of those woodpecker uh, incidents on video someday that would be fascinating yeah wow okay a uh, few people commented how much they enjoyed the talk and commented that their kids enjoyed it so thank you for that um and let's see one person wants to know how you got the acorn woodpecker to sit on your shoulder in the photo at the beginning of the talk yeah. okay well uh there is a place called Hastings Natural History Reservation in Carmel Valley. It's a UC Berkeley research outpost. And I visited there uh, once. Uh, they did a lot of the research that I put into my, that I cited in my book um, was done there on, on um, wood rats and on acorn woodpeckers and on scrub jays. And so I went there and they had a, an injured, uh, that, that bird was named almost because he could <laughs> almost fly and he had gotten used to people. So I just put, reached out my arm and he was on somebody else's arm and he just walked onto my hand and then walked up my arm to my shoulder and stood there. And my friend Carol snapped a whole bunch of photos and got one where we were both looking at each other like that. It was so cool. Yeah, cool. Very cool. Um, okay, back to wood rats. One other question. If there is a wood rat house that's abandoned, are there still other animals? I'm sure there are. Yeah, it's great shelter. So there would be, you know, for sure spiders and insects and but there could even, and the salamanders probably, and maybe rodents. Oh, I'm sure there are. Yeah. 
Let's see, another question is, where do the large flocks of juncos and bluebirds and robins come from that I see in the winter? Are they from up north or up high? Um, they, so bluebirds in, spend the, the winter in mistletoe clumps and eat the mistletoe berries. And they actually, each bluebird family owns mistletoe clumps. And so they, um, they usually are in different places in the winter than they are in the summer. In the summer, they like um, fields where they can catch insects, but not be um, too vulnerable to predators. And so they just move like that. Sometimes it's altitudinal, but sometimes it's even level and just across, across country. Um, robins seem to, uh, they're here year round, but they seem to congregate into flocks in the winter and like starlings do. And it's, that seems to be a strategy. It's thought to be a strategy for finding food because if one bird finds, you know, a nice vineyard with a whole lot of grapes, it'll tell all the other birds where they are and they'll all head there together. Um, I don't, and they roost together at, at, at night. Um, and I think they're just, they're around, but they're just scattered the rest of the year. Maybe they go somewhere else, I don't know. And I can't really answer the question about juncos. Uh, yeah, I don't know where they are in the sum, in the breeding season. No, they they breed here. So anyway, I'm not clear about that. Okay, thank you. And a big hello from the Point Blue Conservation Science team. They say thank right. you so much, and they enjoyed learning from your presentation tonight. Another comment was or actually a question was. If you have any idea what type of oak tree would work as a street tree in an urban, urban setting such as Petaluma? Well, that's, I'm not an expert on that. What you want is a tree that isn't going to put out horizontal roots that will push up sidewalks and things. And I think coast live oaks might be pretty good for that and might uh, also be native there. Um, they send down a, a really deep tap root. And I just read about this recently, but I, I don't remember, but it would, wouldn't be too hard to get an answer. I, maybe I can, if you send me an email uh, through my website, I might, be even be, might even find the uh, article I read about it. Sounds good. But I would urge, and I think valley oaks are actually pretty good too. Oh, I think it was, oh yes, it's in Doug Tallamy's book. That's why I read about it in his most recent book, The Nature of Oaks, the uh, rich, ecology, rich Ecology of Our Most Essential Trees. And of course he's back East, but I think he mentioned blue oaks are pretty good. Um, so anyway, I can look that up. Yeah, that was one thing I was thinking too, was maybe blue oaks if they're, they're up in that area. Okay, um, a couple other questions. One person would like to know if you would uh, talk more about the communal parenting of woodpeckers. Why do they do it, but other bird species don't? And how does it work? Well, there are some other bird species that do what's called cooperative breeding. And like even woodpeckers, I mean, even bluebirds are sort of semi-cooperative. Um, so for instance, with bluebirds, um, you know, I mentioned that in the winter they rely on mistletoe berries and they even own with mistletoe berry clumps. So an experiment was done in which all of the mistletoe clumps were removed, or half of the mistletoe clumps were removed from a particular area. And, okay, I've got to back up. Um, so bluebird parents usually have two broods every season and they all stick together. The first brood sticks around 
and uh, the, and then the pairs and the second brood and the two broods together all forage for food together, sleep together, take baths together. And then at the end of the summer, the females in that from that brood leave and go and join another bluebird family and bluebird female young female bluebirds from another family come and join our original family so now there are foster daughters in that original family and foster siblings and they all hang out together all winter and often the young males and the and their foster sisters uh, hook up and and mate and and the the males who are the sons of the parents often help their parents with the, their next season's brood that help feed them and help defend their nests while also having their own babies and having to feed their own babies. And um, the reason it, for that is thought to be that they want the inheritance of those mistletoe clumps. They wanna have access to the, the food uh, provided by, the, by those mistletoe clumps. And of course, it's the same with acorn woodpeckers. Those offspring uh, are willing to help their parents, or that's how it's evolved, that behavior has evolved, that they, their parents welcome their presence and don't kick them out the way most parents do with their young as soon as their young can support themselves uh, because uh, they help because they help, they help feed their parents' babies, they help, and they help defend the nest, and they help uh, drill holes for acorns and um, store acorns in those holes. So it seems like it's usually, uh, there's usually a, um, an exchange of labor for food. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have two more questions. The first has to do with snakes and wood rats. Um, do this, the, there's sort of a two-part question. Do the snakes eat the wood rat babies and do snakes or rattlesnakes settle in wood rat houses to eat the wood rats? Well, I don't think anybody really knows the answer to that question and it's a, it's a really good one and uh, I've asked it and everybody else has. The, when a rattlesnake, so uh, rattlesnakes tend to take up residence in wood rat houses in the winter, I mean, in the summer. I mean, I didn't mean either of those in the desert. <laughs> and when they do, they'll, they'll slither into the periphery and curl up and the wood rats will wall them off and just go about their business without any interaction with the snake and the snakes will be hibernating all winter. So they, 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 they live in wood rat houses in the winter. And what happens when they leave, I don't think anybody knows. But it seems like if they ate wood rats or wood rat babies, there would have been some uh, evolutionary adaptation that, that would uh, discourage that. So I think they probably just wake up at the end of the winter and slither away and they can't get into the wood rat house because they've been walled off. Uh, they could though go in the entrances and I, I just haven't heard anything about that. Like you hear about rattlesnakes going into um, ground squirrel burrows all the time. Uh, that ground squirrel babies are uh, a major source of food for rattlesnakes in breeding season. But I haven't ever heard about rattlesnakes going into rat houses. Yeah, it seems like a wood rat would be a tasty treat. <laughs> oh, uh, they're delectable. Everybody <laughs> loves them. Anyone who's big enough or strong enough to eat a wood rat and is a carnivore does. <laughs> Um, but what I'm thinking is that wood rats um, always build their houses around something pretty solid like a stump or a rock or a bunch of branches and maybe they have a way of, may, I don't know if the females stop up there, you know, make, make a little fence uh, so that snakes can't get into their birthing chambers. That's a good question. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, 
The last question actually leads into something you mentioned wanting to talk more about if you had time, and I think you do, which is the 11 uses of the squirrel tail. Oh, yeah. Okay. Is Ursula here? <laughs> okay. So um, the primary most important function of a, a gray, this is, these are the Western gray squirrels. They are the tree squirrels that have those really big bushy tails and that we see careening around in the tree tops and, and leaping across chasms. And they um, use their tail for balance. It's extremely important to them for balance. And you may not know that they can drop their tails if they need to. If a predator has grabbed hold of their tail, they can drop them. Wow. Uh, but I don't think That's they can. Kinky. I don't think they can survive very well after that. So in that picture, I <laughs> what you said so much for balance. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. So, um, but that uh, picture I showed you of the, with the squirrel on the branch, um, the squirrel's tail was over her back. And in that case, that was in June. So it was serving as a sunshade and as a camouflage because it breaks up the line of her body. So a predator can't see her. So that's two, sunshade and camouflage. If it's Winter time, the tail serves as a blanket to keep the squirrel warm. If it's raining, the tail serves as an umbrella, kind of like a raincoat to keep the squirrel dry. I hope somebody's counting. <laughs> oh, I should have been writing it down. <laughs> Someone says, well, Elaine has five fingers up. You're on five. <laughs> if, um, if there's something uh, dangerous, if the squirrel is scared of something, see something that's a threat, it will wave its tail like a semaphore. So that warns other squirrels that there's a problem. If it's being attacked, it will wave its tail to attract the attention of the predator. So the attention will go for the tail end instead of the head end. And that's when ah. it might drop the tail. Um, Okay, what are we up to, Elaine? She's down. <laughs> seven, <Not> six, <laughs> seven. Um, squirrel has to swim. The tail helps uh, create buoyancy, and it's also a rudder. So that's nine. If the squirrel falls out of a tree, oops, there's my phone. Sorry. Um, the tail. Uh, the squirrel spreads the trail, tail out so it's like a parachute slowing down its fall and then just before the squirrel hits the ground it whips its tail underneath so it becomes a cushion to cushion its fall <laughs> and if Ursula were here she she came up with a few more the other day when we were swimming at a pool she's a nine-year-old my nine-year-old friend Excellent, excellent. Um, let's see. Oh, we did have one late breaking question. If, if we want to go ahead with that one, it's can deciduous oaks hybridize with live oaks? Yes. If they are in the same group of oaks, which is called, uh, the official name is in the same section. So there are white oaks, there's the white oak section, the red oak section, and the golden oak section. And most of the oaks within a section can hybridize with each other, but they can't hybridize with anybody outside the section. So for instance, uh, among the red oaks, there are black oaks, which are deciduous. They're, they're called black oaks, but they're red oaks, go figure. Uh, they're, they're deciduous, but they can hybridize with any of the live oaks, coast live oak, interior live oak, Oh, not canyon live oak, because that's in the golden oak section. So not any of the live oaks. And live just means evergreen, by the way. But they can hybridize with coast live oak, interior live oak, or I believe shreve oak, um, Quercus parvula shrevii. And that hybrid is called an oracle oak. And you can see them right now. Um, well, you can see them anytime, but it's really interesting to look at them right now. 
because the leaves look like a cross between uh, black oak leaves and live oak leaves. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they think they retain their color much farther into the winter. And that makes me, uh, oh well. Uh, and so, and yeah, so the same the thing, the same thing can happen in the white oak group, like valley oaks, blue oaks, and Oregon oaks all lose their leaves. They're all, those are all deciduous white groups, uh, oaks in the white oak group. But California scrub oak, for instance, is evergreen. And it can hybridize, I believe, with any of those deciduous oaks in the white oak group. Okay, interesting. Um, would you want to give just kind of like a quick overview definition of what it means to you that it, that the idea of oaks as a keystone species, sort of just what that means to you? Well, the term keystone species um, generally means a species without which, if that species disappeared, the ecosystem would radically, radically change. And oaks are the foundation of so many food webs. Um, so many species eat acorns from insects to rodents, to deer, to bears, to birds, that um, if acorns disappeared, a whole lot of species wouldn't have the nutrient dense food they need, including, you know, in the past, uh, humans depended on them very heavily. And some still utilize acorns a lot, mm -hmm. both native and non-native people. Mm -hmm. They're highly nutritious, highly rich in fats, carbohydrates, and protein, and not as much protein, but enough. Um, and then, uh, oaks have huge canopies. So, oh good, that's a great question. Oaks started, oaks um, began their career on this earth of ours about 60 million years ago in Southeast Asia. And they have evolved, they have dispersed all over the Northern hemisphere and part of the Southern hemisphere. And they are the most widespread tree on earth, tree genus on earth. And they grow to be really big and they have really long lives. And you know, all, almost all plants protect themselves with toxins against herbivores, against anybody who wants to eat them. And, and as do oaks, they have tannins and other phenolic compounds in them that are toxic. So in order to be able to eat oak leaves or oak or acorns or oak bark or oak roots, an animal species has to have co-evolved with that, with oaks to, um, have, to develop a resistance to those toxins. And that takes time. And so more species and more kinds of animals have had the opportunity to interact with oaks, at least in the Northern hemisphere, than any other plant species, simply because they're so widely spread, they're so big and they live so long. So insects are the foundation of the animal food chain. And uh, some insects like caterpillars, which are, extraordinarily important, eat a ton of, of uh, oak leaves. They, um, they have to, uh, they, they come out, they hatch out of an egg and they're extremely tiny and they start eating oak leaves and they eat and eat and eat and they molt because they get too big for their skin and they eat some more and they molt again and they molt, they molt four or five times and they get uh, and then they get to a point where they um, form a chrysalis or a pupa, and then they dissolve inside there and come out as an adult butterfly. But they eat so much plant material that they, they can't survive eating 
leaves, for instance, of a plant with, with, that they haven't co-evolved with and have developed resistance to their toxins. So um, that's one of the reasons oaks are such a keystone species because they support so many caterpillars and caterpillars support so, so, um, so many other, so many food webs. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Um, it's about 8.50. Did you have anything else that you wanted to share in the next 10 minutes or so, or have we pretty much covered it all at this point? Well, I have some other fun things I could show you, but I'd have to screen share again. Let's see how many people. Wow, we still have 69 people. We've got a captive audience and countless more on YouTube. <laughs> oh, how many on YouTube? Do we know? Um, there's still 58 watching. Well, I could screen share again. If, it seems like there's some interest. I'd be interested. I wish I, we had asked what age people uh, who have attended today are, or at least- That's a great question, yeah. How many young people we've had? If anybody is uh, still on and they'd like to share, please go ahead either in YouTube or in the Zoom chat. There were a few people who commented that they had um, K through five, middle school. There were some uh, parents of six-year-olds who already commented that they were enjoying the book and enjoying the presentation. So I think it's a pretty wide, wide age group. 13, a person put, just put in. Well, we just got three new people. <laughs> How are we getting new people now? <laughs> okay, well, I'll do a little screen Nothing. share. And 64 and 79. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. okay, so I'll, I'll see what else I have here for you. Great. And while you're doing that, I am going to mention, in case I forget, that those who would like to save the chat, there's a little, if you scroll down to the bottom of your chat with your mouse, there's three little dots there. If you click on those three dots, there will become an option that says save chat. So if you want to save any of those links and other things, feel free to do that. Okay, Kate. Yeah, I want, and, and I don't want us to get off until I've uh, saved the chat also. I want to see it. This is what I was, the image I was going to have up for talking about the squirrel's tail. And then um, this is a scene that I saw on the North Fork of the Russian River a couple of summers ago during COVID, where I spent a lot of time here at this river. And I, you can't see anything particularly unusual here, but now we are going to zoom in. And I'm gonna see if I can bring the volume down because the river is roaring so loudly. So I, I'm bringing the volume down a little bit. It's a little bit of a shock. So here we go. Whoops, that wasn't what I wanted to do. Mm. Mm. Oh. So does that look like just a chunk of moss on a boulder in the middle of a river? Or does it look like something, something else? Some type. Anybody know? A nest of some kind I heard, yep. So here's a closer view. And this is the nest of a bird called a dipper or used to be called a water oozel. And their nests are usually on horizontal ledges close to fast moving water with a high noise, noise level where they're inaccessible to predators and they're above flood levels. Sometimes they're even behind waterfalls and the birds fly straight through the waterfall to get to their nests, the adults. And if moss is available, the outside of the nest is always made of moss and there's an inner sphere of grass and leaves. And here you can see some grasses poking through, which 
makes me think that the female who built this nest refurbished last year's nest instead of building a new one. The males don't help much. And so I saw this in, um, oh, I don't know. First, I probably saw it in May and where the moss was still green. And so I went back to it several times. So this was in, in uh, the valley called Potter Valley near where I live. And uh-oh, I seem to have the wrong slide coming up next. <laughs> I'll, I'll have to skip a few slides, I think. Um, let's see. Where is, uh-oh. I thought I, oh no. Oh, wait. Oh, well here, I'll show you something cool. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is, oh here, so the dipper is coming up pretty soon. But while I was spending a lot of time on the Russian river during COVID, I saw mink four times. And I'm gonna play you a little video now. And if you watch right over here where my pointer is, you'll see a very small little animal swimming along. And then climbing up on the rock. I'll, I'll play it again. Okay. And now back to the dippers. Uh, here is a dipper nest with, you can see a baby's mouth in there right here. And now we're going to see a, a parent bird fly in. And there were, so there were two babies only in that nest. And, huh, I don't know where, there are more dipper, um, well, I wanted to show you some pictures of dippers' eyelids, which when they blink their eyes, they blink more slowly than any bird in the world. And the tops of their eyelids are covered with tiny little feathers. So it's kind of like a semaphore, semaphore when they blink. And it's thought that maybe it's a way of signaling other birds to, um, a, a way of communicating when they can't be heard over high water. Uh, but let's see, I wish I, I don't, I'm not able to see my slides on the left. Well, let's talk about lizards. Um, this is a Western Flint's lizard. There's also called blue belly lizards and you can see a little bit of blue here, which means this is a male. And there are some fence lizards that spend their entire lives up in oak trees foraging for insects, they're, they're insect eaters. And at that place I mentioned, uh, Hastings Natural History Reservation, uh, they did an experiment. Uh, they put out white buckets, uh, like uh, white five gallon buckets under oak trees because they wanted to see what fell out of oak trees. And of course there were acorns and leaves and lichens and moss and maybe some insects, but they also caught quite a few lizards. And they caught one lizard, the same lizard, four times. And they calculated, they have a mostly coast live oak woodland there, and they calculated that on one acre of their land anyway, about 5,000 acres, uh, 5,000 lizards fall out of tree oak trees on one acre of land every year. And they don't know why. One idea is that they might be uh, overshooting when they uh, are going after insects, overshooting their mark. But I suspect it's, my idea is that uh, they're maybe trying to escape predators. And they seem to be none the worse aware for falling out of trees. They also have these, um, this is something that close focusing binoculars are good for. When Anne McGlinty painted this lizard, I asked her to exaggerate this spot right here. And that is a skylight that allows light into this 
the, the third eyes of Western fence lizards, which are set between the occipital bones of their skull. And they used to think that their third eyes were mainly a way to let the lizard know, you know what time of day it was, what season it was, whether they should be mating or not, whether they should be brumating or not, which is uh, the reptilian form of hibernation. But now they know that those uh, third eyes are to are a GPS unit that uh, allows the lizard to read the patterns formed when light from the sun hits the Earth's atmosphere and polarizes. So if the lizard goes on a little trip, it's kind of like it's taking a picture of that pattern every every inch of the way or every time it makes a turn. And when the lizard wants to return home, it follows those patterns in reverse, you know, taking new readings on those patterns and compensating for the progressed position of the sun. So if you take away the lateral eyes of a lizard, of these lizards, not all lizards have these. If you take away the lateral eyes, the lizard will get lost. But if you take away the, um, if you, wait a minute, I'm sorry. If you leave the lateral eyes, but take away the third eye, the lizard will get lost. But if you take away the, the lateral eyes and leave the third eye, the lizard, and all the lizard has to navigate by is that third eye, it will find its way at home perfectly. And what else about lizards? They, um, they can drop their tails and they have several different, what are called fractal planes in their tails. And at each fractal plane, they, they're, they have the ability to sever the tail by um, weakening and disengaging the, the muscles, the blood vessels, the nerves, and the skin. And I can't remember, I think it's cartilage in there, not bone. And so if a predator um, gets a hold of the very tip of the tail, then it'll just drop the tail at the closest fractal plane to the tip and, and on up. And, but it's still not good to play with lizards or do anything that might cause them to drop their tails because if they drop their tails, they can grow a new one, but the ones who have dropped their tails are less likely to find mates for some reason. Well, I think it's probably a good time to stop. I wish I, uh, let me just see <laughs> what I have here. Yeah, yeah, you're gonna really, you're gonna find it the minute. <laughs> what? Oops. You're gonna find it the minute you're finished, right? The one you're looking for. <laughs> hey, how did I get out of, huh? I wonder how that happened. Uh, well, I don't seem to have it here. I would have to open you know what I think I did? I think I, um, I probably set that up in the other PowerPoint presentation from which I was stealing some slides for this one and I didn't realize which one I was in. But well, you, got a, you got an idea about dippers. Yeah, and there's always things that uh, will come up and other things left unsaid that will be fodder for another talk, right? So. Yeah, I'd love to do another talk. Yeah, for yeah, this has been Absolutely fantastic. I did have a couple quick, one other really quick question for you to answer and then we'll wrap it up. Um, okay. Asked about what type of cameras you're using to take pictures of the, um, the different, you know, plants and wildlife and what sort of video cameras you're using. Yeah, um, it's a Panasonic DSC, oh, what are the numbers here I can, I can find it pretty quickly, I think. Um, whoops, 
I thought that was my photo, but it's not. Hold on, I'll have to find one a photo that I took uh, recently. Okay. Oh, oops, that's not mine either. <laughs> Hold on. Okay, I know this is my photo. Oh no, that's my old picture. Hold on, I have to find something really recent. Well, if uh, somebody could, um, oh, here, this will do it. It's, oh, Panasonic DMC FZ300. Perfect. I'll write it in the chat. Excellent. And you take the video with that also? Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, that's, that's really, really neat. Yeah, it's a fantastic tool. I don't, understand the half of my camera. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> it has so many bells and whistles. I just kind of uh, just kind of make do and limp along with it. But I, I do occasionally get lucky and get some good yeah, shots. I think more than occasionally. Well, great. Well, let's let's wrap it up in the interest of time since we are a little bit after nine. And I um, really wanted to thank you for this amazing presentation. It was different than anything I've seen you present before and I really enjoyed it. And I'm excited that we had such a great turnout and a really wide age range. I think it was six to 70 or 80 years old and everything in between, which is fantastic. I did post in the chat um, a, a, few, a link to one of your other talks, and there are several others on YouTube as well, which are to cover different information also about oaks and also about manzanitas. So I encourage people to check them out. They're really good as well. So I will uh, end the meeting tonight and just wanted to send my appreciation to you for your time. Would you like to say one or two other quick things, Kate? Well, I just want to have time to save the chat. Perfect. So yeah. I'll um, let you see that. And I also put it into a Word document for you because it's a little easier to read it that way. Oh, okay. So I'll send that to you as well. But I, what I don't understand is now we have 87 people. <laughs> and before uh, it was only 59 or something. Okay. Uh, save chat. Does everybody know how to do that? Yes. And you basically go down to the three little buttons on the bottom of your chat window, click it, and it will have an option for save chat. Three little dots on three the right. Dots. Yeah, that's a better way of saying it. And I copied the YouTube chat for you as well. And hold on, I just want to go to um, see who's all, who all is here by switching pages. Yeah, and you can also look up participants too. Oh, look up the names. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no. if you click the participants button, you can see at least a listing of people. I don't seem to be able to. I can just, oh well. Anyway, um, thank you everybody for coming and being. This was a really wonderful QA session. There's sometimes no one asks any questions and that makes me feel like they're not really very interested and you have been a really curious audience and I love I've, I've loved the questions so see you next time all right bye. excellent bye thank you bye thank you, Kate. welcome all right folks I am going to be shutting the session down